Okay, thank you, Esme. All right, and now with um, great pleasure, uh, I am able to introduce Michelle Fulner. She is an educator. She is a California naturalist. She is an amateur poet, a parent of two Woodland Sprite daughters, and the host of the Golden State Naturalist podcast, um, which is now ranked in the top 1% of podcasts globally. And I saw on Instagram today, she's also selling Valentine's Day cards. So how cool is that? So go get your cards for your loved ones. All right. Michelle holds a bachelor's degree in English and comparative literature from San Jose State University and a master's in English, specifically in composition and rhetoric from California State University, Sacramento. She is an educator. She's taught middle school and high school. Uh, English and California public schools for 10 years before transitioning her life to a full-time admirer of acorns, California newts, redwood sorrel, and tide pools. Michelle, it is a pleasure to have you and to introduce you to the chapter. So welcome. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate it. And I am very happy to be able to talk to everyone today. We were just kind of playing around with my computer sound and I'm hoping that that's gonna work for you, but I'm gonna share my screen with you now. It doesn't wanna let me tick the share sound button. So we'll just turn it up real loud when I have to share some audio. So hopefully that works. Let me know if you have a hard time hearing anything that I'm saying um, or any videos that are coming through. But yes, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here tonight. I'm super happy to get to talk to so many enthusiasts of California native plants, and it's just an honor to be here. So some people are already familiar with the podcast, Golden State Naturalist, and that has been around for almost two years now. I'm coming up on the second anniversary. It's a love letter to California's ecological past, present, and future. And of course, native plants are a huge part of the ecology of California. So I'm always super thrilled to learn more. And with a background in English, this isn't something that I got an education for. This isn't something that I learned about in my schooling. So I'm constantly learning from others, very much like people like yourself and like Chris. And so it's it's um, great to be around so many of you. So as we get started, I want you to pop in the chat and if you hear my kids outside the door, my husband's putting them to bed and uh, there, there might be kid noises, but, but they will go to bed soon. And um, I want you to pop in your chat why you love native plants. So what is it that you love about native plants? One reason is fine, a couple of reasons is fine. I know that there are many, many reasons. Wonderment, that is great. So see the wildlife they attract. Just give it people a second to pop that into the chat. Why you love native plants. Bugs and birds, yes. Place-based uh, diversion, diversion, I think. That is great, so fun maybe. If I'm reading that correctly, because of the evolution of life, they work here. That's so great. Ecosystem services, they are home. I love that. Their role in ecosystems. Oh my goodness. You guys have so many good reasons. The foundation of life on earth. Yes. Gorgeous. Support invertebrates and other wildlife. I've lived many places. Good to know what's best around here. That is so great. Diversity. <laughs> Spanish translation is on. That's so great. <laughs> I was like, I thought that maybe it meant fun, which is also true. Um, I love bugs and birds. I love California's wild places. Excellent. They teach us about our environmental history. Okay. So I love those reasons and there are so many more. So hold those in mind. There are many people here with many reasons to love native plants. And there really are as many reasons as there are people, although we could find themes, I'm sure, in all of our reasons. All right. So the talk today is about what has not worked. <laughs> what has not worked in my journey as a science communicator? Everything that didn't work, lessons from my journey as a science communicator. 
But don't worry, I will also get into what has worked for me. So I find what didn't work as a really good place to start because I think that it provides a lot of context and I've learned the most from what didn't work. And so I'm hoping that if you are hoping to communicate a, your love of native plants with other people, then this will also give you some lessons that I learned along the way that maybe you won't have to go and learn yourself the hard way. So I know that all of us are at very different places and many people are already doing work where they're involved in science and they're already communicating the work that they're doing. Some people are enthusiasts as home gardeners and maybe they're communicating with neighbors or friends. So all of those are valid forms of science communication and all of those are going to be addressed on some level here. There's something for everyone to take away from this talk. So what I'm going to, the way that I've laid this out is concepts, failures, and successes. But of course, that is not actually linear in real life. It's not like you have this concept and then you try it and you fail at it and then you learn from that and then you have a success. It's more like you try something, but you don't know why you tried it and then you fail at it because you didn't really have a reason. And then you realize, oh wait, maybe this is the reason that I had. And then you try again and maybe it's a little bit better, but maybe not. And you have to go back to the drawing board. So just remember the way that I'm presenting this is not necessarily reflective of reality, um, but it is, it is the easiest way to communicate it and the most kind of linear narrative for a short uh, presentation that I can give you. All right. So again, I want you to hop in the chat really quick and answer two questions for me. One, when do you communicate about native plants? So is there a certain context in which you communicate? Do you tell your neighbors, do you tell your friends? Do you, what do you try to, when are you communicating native plants? And is there a new context in which you would like to try to expand? So maybe you, you know, tell your friends about your favorite plants or you talk to your friends who also are into native plants and you sh swap information and gardening um, approaches or things like that. And then is there a way that you would like to maybe broaden that or take it to a different platform or, and if not, that is also fine. I'm just curious kind of where people are at, what those two questions are for you. Let's take a look here. Good, sometimes at work, neighbors, friends, master gardeners. Ah, yes, get the master gardeners into this. That's so great. Anyone who will listen, wonderful. C curriculum for schools, I love that. Okay, this is this is great. A lot of great places where people are communicating. So people are already doing this work. You're already communicating science. You're already communicating native plants. Docent at nature. Okay, awesome. There's so many good ones. So let's carry right along. And I kind of want you to keep these things in mind as we go, because I want you to be thinking, okay, what is my place? What's my context in which I'm communicating this? And then is there someplace else that I would like to go? And again, no pressure to do that. People are already operating in a great capacity. And I think that there's a lot of power in just talking to people who you know personally. So there, this is not a pressure moment like, oh, get out there and do more communication. You're doing great already. And a lot of this is going to validate what you already know works and hopefully give you some more inspiration. There we go. Okay. But first, I want to talk about hiking with small children. I have two kids. They are ages four and six. This is me and my oldest daughter. This is Ella. She's six years old. My four-year-old is named Hazel. And this is a recent hike. We were out staying with another family out at Sea Ranch, some old friends of ours, and uh, went out and climbed on these rocks. And, and you can see some sea palms out there in the distance. We were admiring the sea palms and this cool view. And sometimes this is what hiking with children is like. More often, this is what hiking with children is like. Uh, this was another occasion at Point Lobos and uh, frequently they will just lay down in the dirt and refuse to go any farther or just, you know, wanna do kind of like, you ever see like a horse roll in dirt and just get totally caked and then have to like shake it off. I don't know. I think there's some kind of deep instinct there from when we were 
quadrupeds. I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that. So going on hikes with kids is always an adventure. But one of the themes that you will notice if you ever do hike with small children that keeps coming up over and over, there is one question. And it, the first question my kids ask is actually, can I eat this? Um, because they've learned to have like trail snacks is actually like the most they will eat plants is <laughs> like things that they find on the trail. And I try to teach them, you know, like only have like a couple of leaves of Claytonia. You got to let that stuff regenerate. You know, my daughter, I look back and she's like a billy goat with all these plants hanging out of her mouth. I'm like, girl, slow down. <laughs> but, but that's their first question. Can I eat this? That and redwood sorrel, they just chow down on those things. But the second question is why, right? Why? does this plant look like this why does this work the way that it works and one particular why recently was this bee that we saw and this was also out at sea ranch under i think it was a bunch of monterey cypress that we were under a bunch of trees and this bee was just kind of digging just digging out some dirt and it was so cute because it would go in the hole and like just back its back its little fat booty back out it was adorable and so we sat and we watched this bee for a little while and my kids wanted to know why why is this bee doing this and so i had guesses but i wasn't sure and i posted this picture and a couple people replied to me um, one of them is crystal hickman and so she identified the bee for me this is a yellow face bee i am not going to say the scientific name correctly bombus va va oh no bombus vosnenskii i don't know and it's getting ready to overwinter. So it's probably a queen, it's a bumblebee, she's getting ready to overwinter. So that's the answer to that why. But as adults, I think a lot of times we can let our, our constant wondering why slip. And I think part of that is because we get a lot of our pressing whys answered when we're young kids. But part of it is that we kind of just get comfortable with not knowing why and going through the motions. And so part of what I want to challenge you to do in this talk is to remember your why. So the thing that you put in the chat earlier, why you love native plants, remember that whenever you want to share that with someone else. And there's a really good chance you're doing that already because a lot of times our desire to share comes from that deep love, right? And so that is pretty easy to have aligned. The one that's a little bit harder is there are two whys to keep in mind. So here are the two big whys that I've found so far. Maybe there are more. But why would someone want to watch or listen to this? So in other words, what do they get out of it? If you're communicating to someone else, what do they get out of it? And why does this matter to me? So the why does this matter to me? Usually we've got that pretty much covered. We're super interested. We know our reasons. We don't always clearly express our reasons or make it apparent to another person why it matters to them. So for example, somebody mentioned master gardeners. And I think a lot of people will call in. I've called into the master gardeners before. Hey, I like I need help <laughs> figuring out what tree to plant in my yard or whatever, right? And a lot of people will call in with questions and their questions don't have anything to do necessarily with the reasons why all of us here love native plants. They've got their own reasons for loving plants. And they're already halfway there because, or more, because they love plants already, right? A lot of people who are interested in gardening. And somebody might call in to the master gardeners and say, I'm really interested in having a yard that is blooming at all times of the year, right? That might be what somebody wants. They just want some color in their yard, right? And that might not be what we're necessarily thinking of as people who are like interested in ecology and we're like, yeah, native plants, like they're gonna support all this wildlife. and People might care about that if they learn about it and they become interested in it too. But right now, maybe their question is, how do I get some color into my yard, right? And so kind of trying to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and realizing that there are many, many valid reasons, just like we all have valid reasons for what we love and why we love it and trying to communicate to the people who are there. So of course that is a conversation and a relationship, which for me, getting into some of my experiences is sometimes tricky, right? Because if you're communicating something on a stage, you don't necessarily always get a two-way conversation or get to know all of the people that you're talking to. So one of those things is, is kind of learning a little bit more about who the people you're talking to and who you're trying to talk to. All right, so keeping those whys in mind, this video is one of those 
learning experiences for me. So this video I posted this summer, and I realized later that there is no why in this video. There's no reason why anyone would want to watch this. <laughs> I think it's a, a little bit self-indulgent. Um, it's kind of like this celebration of, yay, all these fun ways to explore nature, right? Um, but for somebody who is like not my mom or related to me or my friend, like I'm not sure why they would want to watch it. So I'm going to show this to you and the sound I hope will work for you. And let me just kind of check the chat to make sure. Here we go. Okay. Making sure no one's chatting to me about anything I need to need to know about. Um, and I think maybe Sarah or Esme or Victoria, if somebody does say something in the chat that I need to get told about, just let me know. And then let me, sh let me uh, go ahead and share this video with you. All right. And like I said, the sound might not be phenomenal. I'm gonna turn it up as loud as it will go here and play it for you. There's no um, talking in this video, so just, just music. So let me go back to the other one here. I don't know. Oops. What did I just do? I closed a lot of tabs for you guys. I don't know if you can see my tabs. Um, I'm lying. I usually have like 400 tabs open and this is only one of the windows that I have open. <laughs> so anyways, trying to, trying to be less insane. Um, okay. So that video, there's not a real reason for it. I posted that video because I thought it would look cool, I guess. I, I'm not really sure why I posted it. I posted it thinking, you know, maybe maybe uh, the trending audio would help it get more reach. I, I didn't really have a great reason uh, to kind of celebrate California's beauty, but it, I don't think it really effectively does any of those things. So it didn't get a ton of engagement. That video didn't get a ton of reach. And I think the reason why is because I didn't have a really clear reason. I didn't have something that I wanted to say when I put that together. And so it can be frustrating because I spent a lot of time finding the right clips for that video and trying to make it cute and fun and whatever. And, um, you know, when something like that that you put time into doesn't go over the way that you want it to go over, it can be a little bit frustrating, but it, uh, it doesn't necessarily serve a purpose. And so one of the things that I learned along the way is that if something that you're doing isn't serving a purpose and it isn't talking to someone about something that is important to them, right? Cause it might be important to me, right? We all are like our own memories and everything are important to us, but like people on the internet are not my first grade teacher. Like they don't need to give me like a gold star for making a cute video. So um, they, don't, they don't know what that's about. It's just cheerful. Thanks, you guys. You're you're so encouraging. <laughs> yes. Um, but I don't know that it necessarily contributes a lot of value to people. And I don't say this to like crap on my own video, right? Like I'm not fussed about it. It's just a learning experience and learning what kind of works and what doesn't. And so one thing that doesn't work necessarily is is things that what are what are people gonna necessarily, what are they gonna want out of that? What are they gonna get out of that? Okay. So my why my reason for doing all of this, right? Um, I think it really echoes a lot of what you said earlier about why you love native plants. So for me, I want to help more people connect with the place where they live, specifically Californians, people who live in California, because I believe that when we connect with a place, we are healthier and the place we are connecting with is also going to be healthier because we're gonna take better care of it. So that's my big why, right? Helping people connect with place and part of connecting with a place is learning about a place. And so if the things that I create don't reflect that why, that reason why I'm doing it, it might fall flat or it might take off, but not for the reason I wanted it to or in the direction that I wanted it to. Um, I actually had another video kind of take off, which was just sort of a, 
like sassy sort of a video, which I mean, well, there was nothing wrong with it, but it wasn't necessarily serving this why this this particular reason. So I know you know this plant. Um, this video has a why and this was like, I don't know if you all remember I know Esme remembers this summer was like hot hibiscus summer. It was like people were so into the this this native hibiscus and everyone was making a video about it. So I had to jump on the hibiscus video trend. <laughs> I think that maybe Jesse Dixon started it. I don't know if Jesse's here. He said he was going to come. I don't know if he's going to. Um, but I think maybe he started it. I know. I think Esme made a video. I made a video. Find Out Farms made a video. Um, Hedgerow Farms made like everybody made a video. So it was just a big hibiscus summer. Um, but this is the one that I created and this video has gotten more traction for me than any of my other videos. Yeah, Jesse started it. There we go. Uh-huh. I thought so. He's a trendsetter. Okay. So let's watch this one. Okay. And turn the audio on. And I'm going to try to turn that up so you all can hear. So I think this video has a lot more purpose than the last one. Have you ever wondered what California used to look like before colonization? I think about this all the time. And this flower is a great example of why. This is a California hibiscus, Hibiscus lasiocarpus occidentalis, an endangered plant native to just a few select parts of California, mostly in the Sacramento Valley and nowhere else in the world. But the Sacramento Valley now is a very different place from the Sacramento Valley of a few hundred years ago, when the water flowed down freely from the surrounding hills and mountains, filling and overflowing meandering streams and rivers, saturating the soil, creating vast wetlands and floodplains, and allowing tule grasses to grow as tall as a man on horseback. Under careful indigenous stewardship, the land was even richer with abundant populations of mammals like grizzly bears and tule elk, fish, invertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, and so many birds. And this native hibiscus is a descendant of that legacy. It needs the kind of saturated soil that used to be so plentiful here, despite the Mediterranean climate that gets no summer rain. It can tolerate blistering Sacramento summer days and even chooses those days to bloom. Looking at this plant brings to mind a vision of what California used to be like. But it also does more than that. It helps me dream about what it one day could be like again and what we could do to get it there. Hey. Okay. Shoop. Hopefully you could hear that well enough. I'm sorry if you couldn't. The audio is being weird. Let's see. It was just fine, Michelle. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so that video has a lot more purpose than the first video. And if you see them side by side, you can really see the disparity, right? One video, it's like, yeah, that's it's fun. It's a celebration. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to create some content like that, I think, sometimes. Um, but it's not necessarily people who are invested in learning a place aren't necessarily going to get a lot out of it because I didn't tell anyone where they could go to do those things or what kind of species I was interacting with or any of those things. It was just kind of fun and, and music. Again, nothing wrong with that, but not going to get the same amount of traction and not going to necessarily help people or serve people who are wanting to learn something in the same kind of way. Um, so that video had a lot more purpose, but it didn't start out that way. So <laughs> the day that I took that video, actually, Jesse had sent me uh, the coordinates for where to go find those California hibiscus. And I got really excited. And I was like, cool, I'm going to go check those out. And I didn't do it, didn't do it. I had the coordinates, but like I had my kids home during this. I didn't really want to bring them on like a busy road um, to go look at some plants. So finally, they were back in school and I went and dropped them off. And it was a day that I was kind of in a funk. I was just like not happy. I don't remember why but I was just feeling down and uh, hadn't like taken a shower or done anything, anything to like take care of myself really particularly well. But I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go see these flowers and I'm excited about that. So I went and I checked out the flowers and I was like, well, while I'm there, I'll just take a few videos. In no way, in no way did I have any kind of plan for how I was going to put that all together or what it was gonna look like when it was done. I just wanted to collect some videos and go and admire these beautiful, plants and learn something about them. So, and when I got home, um, 
I don't remember if I made the video right away or if I sat on it for a while, but eventually I did some more research on the plant and started to kind of combine things that I had learned from different places and decided to write a script and do a voiceover for it. Because for me, that's a lot easier. Jesse, I don't know if you follow him. If you don't it, follow him, if you enjoy profanity, you already enjoy native plants. Um, Jesse's an absolute hoot, uh, Sacramento food forest. So he is much more on the spot with like he'll do his audio right there i'm kind of like i need to think about it more and both styles are totally great and fine um jesse is hilarious so definitely check him out if you want to see um more native plant content if you don't already follow him but this uh this video i, I that's the way that i put it together because for me, a little bit of extra extra reflection on, okay, what do I want to kind of pack into this video? I've got 90 seconds. Let's write a script and then like condense it as much as humanly possible. And you can't possibly say everything, right? You can't nuance everything in the way that you want to nuance it um, for social media in particular. For the podcast, the nice thing is you can keep on going on and talking a lot longer and not have to condense things as much. So those both work a little bit differently, but both of them, it's important to have that why. And it doesn't necessarily materialize immediately. Which leads me to another story and another question for you. My question for you is, do you have a favorite word? And you can choose to pop that in the chat if you want to, but you don't have to. We'll take a look and see if anyone has a favorite word. It's not required. Petrichor. Oh, that's a great word. Native plants and profanity is definitely his wheelhouse. Yeah, if you if you want native plants and profanity, check out um, Sacramento Food Forest. Do fall. Oh, these are beautiful. All right, good, good, good. Propensity. Oh, sh uh, Schadenfreude is a close second. That's a good one. <laughs> is that the joy at seeing someone else's uh, suffering? Schadenfreude. Am I saying that right? Cliff, you've got good words. Okay. When I was 15 years old, I went to a summer camp and a, an adult in like had a small group of us and asked us this question, what is your favorite word? And as a 15 year old, I did not have an answer to this question, but there was one boy in the group, his name was Justin and he had an answer and he was maybe a year or two older than me. So, you know, very, very impressive at age 16 or 17. And this has stuck with me for, I don't know how many years it's been since then. It's been like 20 years, more than 20 years since I was 15. But I was very impressed because Justin's favorite word was a word I would never even, I didn't know. I had heard it in one context before. Um, but that word was elation elation and i didn't know what that word meant but thankfully justin being an eloquent sort of a fellow explained it to all of us so i got to learn what elation meant um but i had only heard it in one context before which was this because my family which did not take a lot of vacations had gone on a vacation we went on this boat this cruise ship called elation and i had no idea that it meant this sort of ecstatic overwhelming happiness right um and i so i was very impressed with justin's favorite word being elation and also finally getting to learn what that word meant and so this has been sitting in the back of my head for over 20 years and through english degrees and being an english teacher i never have been able to settle on a favorite word and I now finally have, and I'm sure it will change, but my favorite word is iterative because this word for me is life changing because I don't know if anyone else here is a perfectionist or likes to do things very, very like to maybe a ridiculous standard or hold yourself to a really ridiculous standard and expect yourself to do really well. Like the first time you do something, but that is me. And so I find the word iterative the idea that you can create something that's not perfect and then that's just a draft and work on that and reapproach it and come back to it and work on it again and reapproach it and make it better um, and keep on going through that cycle i find that to be an incredibly liberating word and also um i don't know if grace is the right word right but it's a way to be gentle on yourself 
it's like you can iterate. It's okay. <laughs> you don't have to get things perfect the first time. And so if there's anything that you carry away from tonight, just go easy on yourself and remember that this is iterative, right? So anything that you can create, you can create something like Anne Lamott's Shitty First Drafts. I don't know if you've read that book, um, but it's Bird by Bird is like her her great book on writing. But it's this idea, right? You write something that is not fantastic, but you need to have something written in order to improve on it. And so I find it the same way with things that I'm creating. And you may or may not apply it in this exact way, right? Maybe you are creating a flyer that you're going to share, or maybe you're creating some information that you want to share. That Master Gardener's example has really stuck with me, right? Or, or maybe something for your neighbors. I've really thought about how it would be very cool if like more people got involved in their HOAs and tried to communicate with like the HOA committee or whatever it is board to be able to uh, encourage more native plants in neighborhoods, right? Like, so whatever that communication is, it's something that you can go back to and refine over time. And it doesn't have to be this perfect thing right from the outset. Or maybe you're wanting to create videos for social media or whatever it might be, that can also be a process that you can reapproach and keep on chipping away and improving at it and going in this sort of iterative cycle. So that's been incredibly liberating for me. I hope that that is, I hope that that is also helpful for you as a concept. Okay. So I have a question for you. This is something that I have had to iterate on. Uh, how long is a good trailer, like a good movie trailer? How long do you think a typical movie trailer usually would be? More native plants for the HOA, yes. Two minutes, wonderful, yes. 90 seconds, good, good, good. Okay, I think you're totally right. I think those are good lengths. Shorter trailers, 45 seconds to a minute. Okay, so when I first started my podcast, I wanted to create a trailer episode because I wanted to release something to put it out there, to have people be able to find it and subscribe, follow the podcast so that when I put out the first real episode, then I'd already have some followers and the first episode would get some traction, hopefully. So I put out a, a trailer episode. My trailer, it was 10 minutes long. And I just went back and listened to it again today. There's like some weird banging. There's like, there's some sounds happening in that trailer episode. I definitely sound at a couple of points like I'm justifying the fact that I'm there and talking and taking up space. <laughs> um, and there's like my a long story of my childhood that doesn't necessarily need to be there. It's a 10 minute long trailer, very long. So I went back recently and I iterated. I went back and I re-recorded, I rethought, and it really, you know, at the beginning when you're creating something, you don't necessarily know exactly what it's going to look like, right? It's impossible to. You have to start before you know. So I started, which I think was the right thing to do, and I'm grateful that I made a 10-minute long trailer because it got me started. But that doesn't mean that I can't go back and rethink it and 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 change it, right? So I went back and I changed it because I don't think a lot of people necessarily are going to start with that episode zero now that the podcast is out but i do think that it's a really easy thing to share to give people the idea of what the podcast is about so that's why i wanted to go back and i wanted to say okay instead of this 10 minute long whatever this is i want to create something that if somebody's like what is this you know how do i how do i understand what this is i wanted to create a quick 90 second long trailer that I could easily share with people. And then I just added some video clips to it. So if you listen to the podcast, you can hear the 90 second long um, intro, just the audio. But then on my social media, I have the same exact audio, different music, um, but with video clips added to it. So I will show you that now. Okay. The new trailer is 90 seconds. Here we go. Hey, do you want to come outside with me real quick? Just watch your step. The dangerous part is they are made out of sharpened sticks. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to slip because you would be um, impaled. Impaled. 
The thing is, there's a lot to explore in California. Did you get some yet? Not yet. See those beautiful yes. feathery gills? Those are gills? Those are gills. There's a lot to learn about the incredible diversity of ecosystems and species that call this place home. The nature doesn't end where the concrete begins. One of the most important things for healthy fire is just a diversity in how things burn. And about the ways we as humans interact with those systems, relate to them, belong in them. I think there are ways we can learn from native plants on how to improve and live our best life in California. The more we are obsessed with relating to creatures that seem as close as possible to human beings, the less we're willing to go out on a limb to relate to things that aren't human. It's through that act of attention that we make connection and fall in love. I'm Michelle Fulner, and you're listening to Golden State Naturalist, a completely unique kind of nature podcast. Each episode, join me on an adventure out into the landscapes of California to look closely at everything from the smallest invertebrates to the most massive sequoias. During each season of the show, new episodes come out every other week. Make sure not to miss one by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay. So 90 seconds, a lot more manageable, gives much more of a clear idea of what the podcast is actually about rather than kind of me trying to describe it without really knowing what it was going to be. So of course the whole purpose here is just thinking about, and and maybe that's the final version of that. And maybe it's not like, maybe I go in the future because most of those clips are from season one or season two of the podcast. And now I'm getting almost done with season three. Maybe in the future, I want to go and add in some more voices or change out the voices that are included. So that might change again in the future. It can always, we can always iterate. So I think there's a really big difference between 10 minutes and 90 seconds. And hopefully, you know, thinking about that learning process is helpful. Okay. There's a couple things here. I've been impaled. <laughs> um, there's a couple things here. This is mostly, this is, I don't know how applicable this is to what everyone is wanting to do. But if you do want to have more reach, right, and that's not necessarily everyone's goal, but if you do want to have more reach and get a bigger audience, there are things I want to warn you about because these are things that I did not know when I started trying to get more reach. When I started Instagram, when I got on Instagram, I had had an, a personal Instagram account for a long time, but I did not post pictures there. Like I had no idea how Instagram worked. The last time I had used it was probably in like 2007. I don't know. It was a long time ago. And it was like when you had like the sort of grainy square picture of your like bagel or whatever. And then you, you posted that and that was what your friends saw and hopefully liked. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't what it is now. So when I started going on Instagram, um, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I literally was watching a YouTube channel called Tech Boomers because I needed things that were explained to people who did not grow up with computers for me to be able to understand them, right? So I didn't understand how the, the kind of reach works on social media and what kind of a goal might be or, you know, what you're trying to do there. So some warnings about reach, some ideas about reach, um, the lure, the deception, and the poor conversion. <laughs> So my first experience um, on social media trying to get more reach was a promo by an account that to me was a huge account, which is to say they had 4,000 followers, which at that time seemed absolutely mind blowing to me because you know, on social media, when it's your friends, you have a couple hundred followers maybe, or friends. And so to me, this was an insane amount. It was the California Naturalist account. And, um, and I was like, working with them like hey can you guys give me some shout outs can you do some posts they were super gracious and kind I absolutely love the california naturalist program really great people working there and um they were like yeah absolutely like, we want to help out people who have gone through the program and this is very much aligned with what we do so yeah we'll give you a shout out so in my brain i don't know what the heck was going on right so in my brain i was like you have four thousand followers you put some posts on your social media i'm gonna have four thousand listeners of my podcast that's how this works. 
Y'all, that is not how that works. <laughs> so I don't know if you have learned that already. The people running the social media for the California Native Plants groups have probably learned that followers and likes and those kinds of things does not necessarily convert to whatever you are trying to get people to do. Um, getting them to go off app or to do something else is a huge ask. And um, I think it really helped me particularly California naturalists, because they are super duper aligned with um, what I do and what they really inspired a lot of this podcast. And so having their voice in particular was like the most helpful possible voice and, you know, still only results in a handful of people who are willing to go off app to follow up with something. So that was not the uh, big boom of followers that I was hoping for when I asked for a collaboration with them. So promo by even bigger accounts have also had little to no impact on podcast downloads. So what I did notice is that you'll get more of a following on social media if somebody on social media gives you a boost, right? But if um, if you're hoping to get people to go off platform in any way, whether it's an in real life kind of event or going to another platform, that is a million times more challenging. So just a word of caution if you're trying to grow. Um, but again, that's not necessarily always the goal. Okay. So my first reel, I want to share with you my first reel, because this is along the same lines with reach. Okay. I was very excited about the reach of this and you probably recognize this plant. Does anybody recognize this plant? You probably do. This plant, this exact plant that I just took a picture of today and put into this presentation was gifted to me by Chris Lewis. The first time that I met her, elderberry yes so chris lewis gave me this the first time i met her was at her house because i guess just go to people's houses i guess um this is when i was in my calnat program and i had i was in mexico the day that she did her presentation and i was bummed i was mega bummed because i did not want to miss the day where we learned about native plants and so i missed chris's presentation and so i straight up was like hey can you teach me about native plants like a weirdo and she was like come to my house and I was like cool you're the best person and also gave me this elderberry and now it's in my backyard and so um, I went out and took a picture of it today to include in this presentation um, we all have an elderberry that's been tended by Chris Lewis I love that so much that is wonderful okay so my first reel again with reach right I was very excited about my first reel because I didn't know that reels were a thing I didn't know stories were a thing. I didn't know reels were a thing. I didn't know any of that. So I had a friend who was on Instagram sometimes and I was like, friend, Janae, what do I do? And she was like, you got to post reels because that's where the traction is, right? Like that's what gets the most play. So I was like, okay, I'll make a reel. But I had no idea why or what to make a reel about. Um, this thing is a mess, but it got 3,400 views, which I was so stoked about. That is more people than went to my high school. Um, to me, that is like, uh, that was unfathomable to get that amount of views. And I still think that's a ton of views, right? Like 3,400, that's a lot of people. So I was super stoked. Um, but I'm going to show you this reel because it's a mess. Okay, let's watch it. I don't know if the sound is relevant in any way. I, I, don't, I think I did. Oh, I did talk. Okay, here we go. Let's listen to it. And there are just, I'm just like in a forest of them. Very exciting. Wonder what my odds are of seeing an elderberry longhorn beetle. Probably not good. But the plants are super cool. Okay. So that's, that's the whole video. That's it. And, and I want to point out that one person commented on this. You want to know who it was? It was Cliff. Thanks Cliff. Ride or die from the beginning. Um, Whoops, he was telling me about the, the Beatles, not the band. Okay, so I say the video is a mess because I didn't know why I was creating it. Um, it doesn't really, like, I'm clearly like, I have to post something. Here's a person in the, the wilderness of Sacramento. <laughs> and, and so I'm just putting this together, like, I have to make a reel so people will listen to my podcast. And then I was flabbergasted because so many people watched it. 
you might have noticed that it had very poor engagement though it had one comment and it had like 43 likes or something like that so the engagement not out of this world um but still i was so stoked about these views that i'm like i'm gonna have 3,400 listeners in my podcast again not how it works i had not learned my lesson from the calnat thing uh i did not get that many listeners to my podcast and uh that's not how that works at all so didn't get much engagement i'm curious what you think this video was lacking but you're nice so you probably won't tell me but i'm gonna tell me and i'll tell you what i think it was lacking which is a reason for existing right i don't know that it's really trying to communicate anything to anyone it likes it's got elements there of things that work right like it's it's got some ideas there but they aren't like brought together in any kind of meaningful way so so bringing together this concept i could have done some cool stuff about the valley elderberry longhorn beetle for sure could have made a whole video about them i could have made a video about like uh the edibility of elderberry or the way that it helps wildlife there's a lot of different things that i could have talked about in that video but instead i just sort of (laughs) like halfway drowned and then like just pulled out pulled out fast before I could fully drown um which is fine and again I'm not like please don't think that I'm talking bad about myself I'm proud of myself for creating that video and putting it out there because that's how you iterate you can't make something better unless you make something so I'm proud of my early self there for creating a video that had something I was trying to do something I don't know what I was trying to do but I was trying to do something and then I had to learn from that process from that experience all right so reach isn't enough right so if Calnet gave me this great boost. They've got 4,000 followers. My reel got 3,400. I should have 7,000 something podcast followers now. No, that's not how it works. Just getting that reach isn't the way that it works. That's not enough. It's not enough to get people to convert, to go off of a platform, to do something. Um, and people will just keep on moving if it's not something that offers them value. So either some entertainment value or a story or some kind of substance or information. Um, those are the things that need to be baked in. That's always the big question to go back to is why would someone want this? What does what value does this add to them? And I'm just looking at time and realizing that I probably need to bust through some stuff here. So serve people where they are. Um, don't make people go off platform because that's just really hard to do. Um, and eventually, if you build trust on a platform or wherever you are, whether it's in real life or on social media, you can build trust there. And eventually, if they learn to trust you, then maybe they'll want to see what else you're doing and what else you're creating. Okay. So I already kind of said this. Remember to ask why. Narrative. And I'm going to blow through this quick because I'm running short on time here. I don't want to take up your whole night. Um, Stories are super important. What's kind of ironic is that as an English teacher, it took me a really long time to figure this out. And I'm still figuring out how to fold in more story, more narrative into what I'm creating. So great stories stick. I don't know if you recognize this man. This is Miguel Ordignana. And he's one of my favorite people because he has a great story. Um, And he's also just a very cool dude. But I interviewed him in uh, Griffith Park because he's the person who discovered the mountain lion P-22 living in Griffith Park um, 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, however long ago that was now. And uh, this episode was really interesting. It actually became a two-parter because we talked for like two and a half hours and I had to trim that down to even fit it into two parts. And so now there's like two hours plus of content of Miguel on the podcast. It's uh, like a two-part episode. And when I interviewed Miguel, it was very different from some of the interviews that I've done before, because usually we talk a little bit about someone's story and then we talk a lot about whatever the topic is for that podcast episode. With Miguel, a lot of it was his story. And I was down, right? Like I was like, this is cool. He's got a great story. I'm keeping this in here. I'm splitting it into two parts rather than deleting a lot of stuff because I think his his story is important. But I also was like, how is this going to go over? Is this going to resonate with people? Is it not? I don't know. And maybe it's just me that likes the stories. Maybe people are going to be irritated because he's not talking enough about like mountain lions, which he did talk a lot about mountain lions and stuff too, which was very cool. But Uh, A lot of it, a lot more than usual was his story. So I was a little worried about just how that would go over. But this episode is one of the ones where people will come to me and say, you know what episode I really loved was that episode. Somebody just the other day was like, Michelle, that episode was two hours of you and Miguel talking. 
And when it was over, I was so sad because it was over because Miguel wasn't talking anymore. <laughs> so, so stories have this incredible resonance and stories stick in people's brains. So why tell stories when you can just tell facts, right? It seems more direct to tell just facts. Well, in Dr. Jennifer Aker's research at Stanford, 5% of audience recalled statistics. Only 5% of audiences recalled numbers and statistics that were in presentations where 63% remembered stories. So if you want information to stick, stick it in a story. That's gonna help it stick a lot better. That's something that I'm still figuring out. I'm learning from people like Miguel. I'm learning from people like Griff Griffith um, and a lot of other wonderful storytellers. Jane Kim, who's a visual storyteller. So there are a lot of wonderful people that I am learning from as I go. But narrative, super important. If you think of yourself as a storyteller, you're already miles and miles ahead. Think of native plant stories that you can you can tell. Yes, raised hand. Oh, how do I do that? Oh, unfortunately, I don't think we can take audio from audience members. Oh, so, okay. Uh, for the person who raised their hand, if you can add your question to the either the chat or the Q and A. Awesome. And then I think we'll we'll get through the rest real quick, and then we'll come back to uh, Q and A at the end. All right. So we're almost there. I'm curious for you, and I'm not going to give us really time for this, but I want you to reflect on it. What will you try first? Is there something here that resonated with you that you're thinking, ah, maybe there's a different context in which I can communicate my love of native plants, or maybe there's a different situation, a different platform. Um, and maybe one of these strategies or one of these concepts resonated. Um, think about one that you will try first. I also added this because in case we had extra time, we do not. But still something that I want you to think about, who are some science communicators you admire and what do you think makes their style effective? So a lot of people love like Science Friday or Ologies, or there's a lot of wonderful um, science communicators out there. Um, so think about those that, uh, David Attenborough, he's a treasure, um, which ones you enjoy and why. So actually trying to kind of analyze those, those styles. Okay. And questions. So let's yes. go. Go ahead. Um, oh, sorry, Michelle. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm not sure if Sarah is going to chime in, but um, it, if she does, she wants to. That's totally fine. But I'll go ahead and ask you this question from Eliza Rasmussen. I noticed you have a lot more video than photo posts. Do you think photography can be a strong educational tool as well? Or is video the answer? Well, now we come to the dreaded algorithm. <laughs> so that is something where I think that I think it really people should lean into the thing that they're most comfortable with and find a way to leverage that. I think that that's really powerful. Wow, who is it? There's somebody doing this cool project. It's like the plants of L.A. Has anyone seen that? Somebody's going out and photographing like every plant species that's in LA County, I think. And it's a photo project and it's been picked up by maybe the LA Times or it just got some media attention recently. So absolutely that's getting even like bigger attention and farther reach by doing something interesting with photography. And so I do think that the internet is so saturated with photography that it can be really hard to differentiate yourself and to do something that's unique with photography. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it because again, you can iterate, right? Like you can start with something and you can say, okay, here's the photography that I'm doing. Some people are going to find it and like it even before you find your exact style, or maybe you already have found your exact style or what unique thing that you have to say or your message. Um, but even if you haven't yet, then you can keep on iterating. Beautiful, thank you so much for that. And on behalf of everybody, Michelle, um, thank you so much for um, everything you've shared today. I think it's so important. All these tips are great, whether you're wanting to communicate uh, online, um, uh, a, in a podcast type format or one-to-one -one, as many volunteers here do or wish to do. Um, I, for one, love 
being like the used car salesman of native plants like <laughs> what do you need let me sh- introduce you to the plant <laughs> that can fit your needs so um yes on behalf of everybody thank you so much for everything you do uh another sacramento based superstar here um that you are that is part of this wonderful um ecological and native plant um advocacy community so yes thank you so much michelle Appreciate thank you esme presentation yeah and i have time for a few more questions but i know it's eight i don't know if you need to cut us off yeah like i said if somebody i will give um, a minute or so for folks to if anybody has a unanswered question please type okay. it in the q and a um that would be where you would want to drop a question for michelle um but there's no let's see we'll give it a oh, few seconds fine. but yeah if you no want to share something um here in the last you know couple minutes anything you want to close this out with we'd oh, love I to just, hear you michelle yeah i'm just giving a little sneak preview here the next episode is going to be with obi kaufman nice so we went and hiked up mount diablo which is kind of his home mountain and and chatted there yes yes so. I love all the space um, for artists as well to be science communicators. Um, uh, but really, uh, anybody can be a science communi- communicator. Communicator, and I love how you reminded um, us that it doesn't have to be necessarily in this, you know, statistics or facts-based um, type of way, but. Um, it, it can be just gardener to gardener, neighbor to neighbor. That's that's also communicating um, a lot. So we do have one um, question here, and I think it's more for social media. Do you ever worry about oversharing or privacy? Do you keep your rough drafts posted? It says. Um, oh, oh, so. I try like my big thing is not trying to reveal like where my house is specifically or my kids faces. Other than that, I'm not really worried about privacy or oversharing too much. Um, those are the ones that that I'm cautious about. And honestly, like I'm not too worried. Like I'd show a picture of my kids faces in this presentation um, in a small group, but just putting it on the internet feels like weird for me. So um, I try to keep those things more private. Um, rough drafts, I don't post anything that I don't feel like I'm comfortable with everyone on the internet seeing <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> um, so I, the I, final iteration. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, and then I might go back later and, you know, make a new version of something that's a better iteration of that idea, but I'm not going to um, put anything out there that I don't want people to see. And then somebody did put a question in the chat as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Jen asked, how did you learn all the science and nature stuff? Yeah, so um, I learn as I go, (laughs) very much. So doing the California Naturalist program gave me a little bit of a foundation and general understanding. I was always kind of a a nature kid. I really liked to be outside and catching snakes and bats and all kinds of things. So that was sort of my childhood. And then I never learned about it in school. So it was it's just a matter of knowing what my strengths and weaknesses are and trying to shore them up with people who are you know a lot of that is why it's an interview podcast right so like let's ask someone who is an expert and then i will do some googling to try to figure out what else i need to know to be able to make sure that i understand it too exactly and you mentioned and i think you know joining a group like california native plant society your local chapter volunteering um you get so much just from day to day and or just being exposed, being in the community um, and and starting to network with so many folks who hold a lot of different facets of knowledge and experience is also a great way to learn. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, And I think, you know, just to respect time here, um, we will end it there. Again, Michelle, thank you so much for starting us off here in the 2024 with the CNPS chapter Zoom meetings, um, Sacramento Valley Zoom meetings. We're really appreciative of your time and 
and generosity and everything you're sharing, all the stories you're sharing with us that just keep us curious and wanting to know more. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. All right, everybody, and have a great night. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye.